Nice meeting you. Facebook. <laughs> Facebook. Look, we've got comedy royalty in the house here. I said that like a white person in the house. <laughs> I am so white. <laughs> Tina Graham, Facebook. Look at Tina Graham. My God. Tina, hi. Ugh. Oh, my gosh. You've been 31 years at comedy. Hi. hi. Is there a delay between when I talk and you hear me? No, I can hear you just fine. Okay. You've been in comedy 31 years in the biz. Oh my God. I started when I was three. <laughs> <laughs> and you belong, you belong to Uptown Comedy Club of Harlem. Oh my gosh. Oh yes, yes. They actually gave me my first television break. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And you've had the pleasure, you've had the pleasure of of working in urban rooms, and then now you've launched careers like Mike Epps and Monique. What in the world? Look at that. Do you know how touched I am to talk to you? Oh, my gosh. So many people are just, to, you know, they're just in awe of someone like you to work your way up from being on stage to being a talent coordinator, to a producer, to executive producer. My God, does it get any better? Yeah, I just, I, I, I get the joy out of seeing people do what they love. Oh, wow. I, I started with talent shows with more so singers and dancers back in the early 80s. I hired some people to do some of the talent shows. And when I moved to Jersey. Okay, something went wrong. There it is, okay. Yeah, somebody was trying to. Oh, okay. It was actually a bit of a life I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I hit the reply button. <laughs> it's either a bill collector or a booty call. <laughs> no booty call. <laughs> so. You, I have to get my uh, Cooper situation set, set, set up. <laughs> <laughs> You were doing modeling? Swimwear lingerie. My mother had a routine, so she was like, ah, I need you to hit the runway and sell this. Oh, my routine. gosh. Wow. So I was like, oh, okay. That's so cool. I on the runway. Did you? Local, you know. But I started doing talent shows when I was in like the ninth grade in a little small town called Clarkton, North Carolina. You know, and I... See, people had talent that they were just wasting. You know, nobody even knew they had talent. And I would go to every school in the county and get to participate. What? That's so I cool. I moved to Jersey in 84, yeah. And I started brought the talent shows here and the fashion shows. And one time in 1995, I implemented both the comedy and the fashion together. And I put the comedians on the runway. <laughs> I can't wait for that. That's great. Oh my gosh. I could just see him work in the runway. <laughs> I had a hundred and fifty comedians. That was horrible. I was like, oh my god, I have enough clothes. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my god. Wow. Yes, they come all over the country. No egos, just nothing. They all it's almost like a a convention for them. You That's know, so cool. that never met each other. They meet on the runway. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you're you're That's like the good thing. You know, you're in this to promote them, which is such a selfish thing. And I was hoping this would be your moment to feel like you're queen for a day. Do you remember that? <laughs> if I had a million dollars, yeah, you deserve to be queen for a day. I'll tell you all the all the things you've done for other people. My my parents came over here after the Holocaust. They survived and they lived in Jewish Harlem. So that's a certain sector of Harlem. So I've always felt connected to the, okay. the Jewish Harlem. But, I mean, when we go through the things that you have done and worked on, oh, my gosh, this list is anybody, if you're breathing, you know these names. You've got Showtime at the Apollo. Oh, my gosh. How exciting. Well, first is, yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh my god. So they sent me out to find comedians. At first it was VHS tapes. And this is like 1991, 92. Mm -hmm. So nobody really had VHS tapes. I think a VCR cost about $700. <laughs> <laughs> so they were sending me that cassette tape. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Wow. And the promoters were, and the club owners were really good about bringing me to their cities. Like Rashawn McDonald, what he's in Houston, Texas. You know, he's um, his manager, or well, Steve, he's manager, Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey had a club too. Wow. Atlanta, Gary Abdo, at Uptown Comedy Corner, uh, Chicago, they had all jokes aside. So I was, and it would be, it would be the comic, you knew they were really good at the time because they spent their whole life without television. Wow. Just doing stand up comedy. Wow. So they were already ready. Oh my goodness. For a platform to show what they could do. Oh my gosh. That's kind of like when talkies became real movies. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you're probably not allowed to say who in your life as a comic that's still alive was your favorite. But of those that have gone on before us, who influenced you or who did you, res whose comedy resonated with you the most? Well, growing up, I resonated with Flip Wilson. Oh, wow. Carol yes. And then along came Eddie Murphy and Saturday Night Live. And then in the meantime, I was a, a avid listener to albums by Richard Pryor. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Oh, that's a you know. good point. Yeah. Yeah, even uh, because you have to be really good to have people focused. Like if I was doing a room full of blind people, they wouldn't be able to see me, but they could hear me. They have to be able to visualize the joke. Wow. That's yeah. a great so tip. I like comments that make me think and whatever they say, even if I'm not looking at them, I know it's funny. Oh, what a great litmus test that is for us younger comics. That's amazing. Yeah, and it's always good to like talk about stuff that actually happened to you that you noticed by other people. I tell Thomas read that page eight in the newspaper. Because the front page, everybody's going to be talking about it. If you go in deep in the paper, you'll find a whole lot of other stuff. If they even have paper anymore. <laughs> <laughs> people are so wussy, they're afraid of ink. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm just telling them to talk about stuff that other people, you have to stay original. Because if you 
you're talking about the same thing as on front page, everybody's going to have your take on it. Yeah. You know, it's about, it's about having your own opinion and point of view and talk about it. I mean, a lot of times, copies start out talking about their family. <laughs> well, the family might get perturbed, but, you know, it's funny. You know? <laughs> <laughs> At two years old. What would you say? Wow. In a competition. No way. Yes. That's the thing about you. I can, with all these credits, you are so humble. So where does that come from? Is that just how you were raised, or you just seen enough egos in the business to say, I'm not going to do that? That's just where I was raised. I've never been a selfish person. I've never been selfish. I never wanted the spotlight. I wanted other people to be in the spotlight. They gave me that nickname called the Godmother of Comedy. Oh. Because I let so many comics stay with me when they didn't have anywhere to stay. In New York, every comic should hit New York every, every time. So when I go to places like Arkansas, Birmingham, Alabama, even Atlanta, some of the rural cities that, that you don't really get to see comics, they may not have that opportunity to drive to Atlanta or bigger city where auditions are held. So I would do the sea market. And I would see somebody that's got like the it factor or the potential to be bigger than what they are. I would tell them to come to New York. Like, I don't know anybody. So I had a spare bedroom and a couch. Wow. And I let them come stay with me. I would give them the keys to my house and my car because I'm not trying to drive all over the place. I'd give them the address and the promoters. I would call the promoters and say, you really need to put this guy on stage. And from that point on, they, if they're funny enough, They'll pay them the next time they come. Wow. What's... Now you have to develop the fan base. You have to develop that fan base. In, in the beginning, it's not about the money. It's about developing the fan base. These fans are the people that pay to see you. Yes. If you're funny enough, they're worthy of them paying to see you. They, they, you know when you're funny. Yeah. If somebody's walking up to you saying, when are you going to be next? You already know. That's where it's pulling the pay to see you. Exactly. Of all the things that you've been a part of, what is the thing you're most proud of? Of the comedian success. Oh my gosh, I love you so much. What a what a heart. Oh my gosh. We lost two legends that you're probably very painfully aware. Yeah. Mr. Harold and Little Richard. Oh my gosh. I posted a picture of my cousin. Is there anybody you don't have a picture with? <laughs> <laughs> I, see all, I see all your pictures and I'm like, she's living the life. <laughs> You're really, the, that's such a fun life. But the way that you are living the life is by helping other people and staying humble. So what a great way to leave a legacy. Oh my gosh. You know, you're an idol. I'm sure you're an idol to a lot of people. So th thank you for doing that. I just do what I do and, you know, and hopefully it'll help somebody. Yes. I just was raised. That's my great grandmother raised me, so. 
Where were you raised? Oh, Yeah, Jersey's Jersey is a tough place to make comedy happen, isn't it? Competitive. Actually, the time you started here, stand-up wise, it's a place called Terminal D on Tuesday night. It's back in 1988. Really? It was two places that you can do urban comedy. That was a place in Jersey. It held about maybe eight people. And the Uptown Comedy Club in Harlem, which was the National Black Theater, that held maybe 100 people. Wow. That's right. Oh my God! That's so cool. back in the day watching the Rat Pack who had one person of color in it and sometimes he was in the picture <laughs> Sammy Davis Jr. and sometimes he was in the pictures so I'm not stupid you know I can add yes if at all Yes, we do. We, you know, I think uh, white people think that racism is all over with, and that's so ridiculous. Because, no, you're part of the problem if that's... No, that's not true, but a simple fact, how many radio stations do we have? How many television networks do we have? Thank None. you. None. Because it's not about race. It's about the fact that they have the money TV shows that we have. Yeah. There's no Cosby where you show us is a doctor. Thank or you. A lawyer. You don't have a different world anymore where they showed us in college. Mm mm. You know, it's just almost like they discredited Bill Cosby just so that those shows wouldn't be on. Well, I'm going to go pretty political right now, but my dad, uh, he said when Michael Jackson was coming up the ranks and he was becoming super famous, my dad said, you watch, they'll find a way to bring him down. Absolutely, absolutely, everyone. Everyone, they're trying to make friends. I mean, they're still trying to bring Michael Jackson down. They don't want to leave, a, they really don't want a black man to leave a legacy. Yes. You know, and it's, 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 it's bad because the role models that kids are seeing, they brought up watching videos. Like you ask them what they want to be. Oh, I want to be a rapper. I want to be a, a they don't aspire to be doctors and lawyers because they don't see that on TV. And a lot of them are being raped. And as soon as they come out, go in there and watch TV. Yes. That's you know, true. It's almost like the television is raising your kids. And if that's what they see on TV, that's what they're going to Because the bottom line is, these kids are out eight hours a day. 
They influence is other to me, uh, other people. You gotta work eight hours a day. You don't want to be bothering kids when you come home. <laughs> then you gotta sleep eight hours a night. Yeah, whole day is gone. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know? And you don't know, instill like my great grandmother raised me, so she made sure I went to church, so I have something to believe in, which is God. Yes, I believe you know, in God. Everybody needs something to believe in. That's why gangbangers what can easily influence your kids because they look up to them. Yes. Everybody needs someone to believe in. The first people that you believe in is your parents. That's right. So you have to lead by example. Now, if you're making your kids have other people that's mentoring them because you don't have time to listen to them, somebody will. Yes. Yeah. So, what is the thing that eludes you in your career that you still would love to do besides your next project? Actually, I'm trying to be an author. Nice. <laughs> this is right about my journey, you know, some of the people I've met. You know. I would love to read that. I will buy that book. Please let me know. Oh, I would. Do you know how many people have been? Oh, I would. I would so read that the first week I get it, and probably have to go back and look at it more and more. I don't know what else. I don't. I just the people you have bumped elbows with, and the things you've had to have learned have to go in a memoir. Have to. Yeah. You gotta write the book. Mike asked me all the time. Tim, you sleeping on your money. I don't know what does that mean. He said, write the book. I buy three copies. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at him. He wrote his book. Need to get all the comedians to sell copies out of the trunks of their cars. <laughs> <laughs> this has been. <laughs> somebody sent me a passage from Ricky Smiley's book. And I was like, what? They sent me the passage. Somebody put you in their book. I was like, for real? Someone bought the book. It was Ricky Smiley. Oh. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so he was giving you credit. <laughs> Don't they have to ask you for permission? No, not to mention your name. Ah, okay. I don't think so. I mean, if they wrote the book, a whole paragraph about me, uh, uh, a whole chapter. <laughs> so you're... I think that's only in the documentary that they got to do that. Oh, okay. Well, your grandmother was a huge influence in your life and church because you believe in God. And then was there any person outside of family like a teacher or a, a comic that said you know you you really should keep going don't give up that really hit you hard or no not really um it's one person that actually brought me into comedy that was bob sumner he uh, actually was a couple judge my front of my talent shows a couple times and the, the brown brothers those two actually influenced me to push ahead with what I was doing. And the, the Brown Brothers still pushed me to, you know, try to push me to my limits. And Mike Epsi always tried to influence me to keep going like I did with him. Aww. Well, in the beginning, yeah, Bob Stubner actually told me that I could do comedy at a, at a, at a, at a bar in a hall that I was managing. He came there and he saw what I was doing. And he told me about Terminal D. And he introduced me to the Brown Brothers, which owned the Uptown Comedy Club. So I was wow. actually a client of the Uptown Comedy Club first. <laughs> <laughs> so I was at college from them on Wednesday night. I always had Wednesday night. It was always the open mic for comics to actually get better. Wow. So I like to watch their growth, man. And I keep telling them, if you want another joke this week, this week keep coming back. I didn't care if you bomb, but I know you're only going to get better if you got that stage time and that confidence and you wrote them jokes, you know, until they got funny. 
you know, so they always, it always works. You get better with time. As long as you put in the work, and keep going. Yes. And notice that you have to be able to take constructive criticism. You know, if you fail today, make a joke about it tomorrow. You know, you, you laugh at your name. I love it. People love it. When I first started comedy, I went on stage with my brain injury and everybody was giving me feedback that my setups were taking too long and to stay off, get to the punchline, stay off the premises. And so I know. So my joke, that was painful, so I made a joke that when I first started, they told me to stay off the premises, so I never went back. We can always find a way. You, after, you, after a while, if you record your stuff, you see where the laughter comes in. Yes. Yes. You know, like when, so I was sitting in the back when I was actually working with comics, I'd sit in the back just to see what other people say. And as a manager, you don't really want to discourage the comedian. So if somebody said, Well, she is too loud or he is too loud, I would go to the you might want to tone it down just a little bit. I would tell them what people say because that that discouraged me. That's great. Why they why not they fit it? Because sometimes they didn't know everything anyway. <laughs> Yes. But if you can't take a script of criticism, you got to get out of the business. You got to. That's what's going to help you. No, nobody's perfect. So you got to know what your flaws is and what better you want to tell than the audience. Yes. Those are the people that you're trying to make laugh. I, once I went through Philadelphia asking all the young people, when you look at me, what do you see? And when you see an older person doing comedy, what do you want them to say and what don't you want them to say? And then I went back and redid my whole set. <laughs> yeah, the audience will let you know, honey. We're like kids. <laughs> <laughs> you know, kids don't know nothing but the truth. So. Yeah. <laughs> Take it. No, I, I made it in. <laughs> yes, I made it. Yes, ask for ask for the advice and then take it. Yeah. So I've taken a lot of your time, and you are a queen for a day as far as I'm concerned. It's been my joy. Just a pleasure, pleasure meeting you. I wish you all the best. Yes, yes. Well, if you come to Vegas. Yes, and it's safe. And if you come to Vegas, look up Miss Arkansas and me. We're both doing interviews. She might hit you up to do an interview, too, if she hasn't already. I love her. Isn't she? I love her, too. Oh. 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 Thank you. Oh, she is beautiful on the inside and out. She's a good friend. Yes, Thank you so much, Tina Graham. Well, thanks for having me. I love you a lot. I love you a lot, and I look up to you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Um, thank you. Take care.
You okay. too, bye. Wow, talk about humbling. I didn't, wasn't able to get to these messages here. Sorry, you guys. I'm just now waving back at some of you. What a great lady. Isn't she a great lady? So humble. Oh my gosh. I cannot believe her. Always thinking about what's good for the other person. I mean, what, what a person to look up to. Oh my gosh. This is just the most humbling thing I've ever done. Talking to people with 20, 30, 35 years of comedy. And look at her, 31 years in urban co comedy. She's with the Uptown Comedy Club in Harlem. It's the first black owned comedy club. And she helped launch careers like Michael Epps and Monique and Oh my gosh, Tracy Morgan, and she's worked her way up from being a talent coordinator to a talent producer to talent executive producer. She's worked for Showtime at the Apollo. Look at this list. Showtime at the Apollo. BET Comic View. Laugh-a-Palooza. Uh, HBO Snaps. Deaf Comedy Jam. Jam Bad Boys of Comedy Tour. She's worked with Bill Bellamy. And, and his who's got jokes. I mean, this lady, and she, she's leaving a legacy of being in it for the other people. It doesn't get any better than this, you guys. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for the interview. I adore you, and I will never forget interviewing you. Thank you so much, Ms. Tina Graham. Love you a lot, for good reason. Thank you.